So I think we'll get started. Uh, I'm anticipating a few people might trickle in, but, uh, but maybe not, but we might as well get started. I don't think we're waiting for anyone in particular. I blame the weather, the Sunday morning, the concurrent other panels, which apparently also don't have a ton of people there, but, uh, but we'll talk amongst ourselves. This is being recorded, so everyone else can enjoy it later on their own time. Uh, my name is Archie McLean. Uh, I'm a journalism a professor at Mount Royal University, um, a relatively new in that role. Uh, and uh, we'll be, I'll be moderating the discussion today. Um, judging by the show of hands that I saw yesterday, we have a lot of journalism educators at this conference. And probably, uh, if, if some of you have had the similar thoughts uh, that Janice have had and, and Errol has had, which is, what is the role for student journalists in the local news ecosystem? Uh, every year we have a cohort of enthusiastic young students who are doing journalism already in the community. Um, and so what, what role should they play? What are the challenges and opportunities in, in doing more student journalism, in doing better student journalism, uh, and, and what to make of that? Uh, so we have uh, three panelists here. Uh, the first uh, talk is going to be from Errol Solomon. Errol is a visiting scholar at uh, University of Pennsylvania in the Annenberg School for Communications, uh, and he's the work and labor editor of JSource. Uh, Errol's the co-editor of a book, Journalism in Crisis, Bridging Theory and Practice for Democratic Media Strategies in Canada, which was published by the U of T Press last year. And his research has also been published in Journalism Studies, Digital Journalism, the Canadian Journal of Communications, and Triple C, Communication, Capitalism, and Critique. Uh, my colleague Janice Paskey, who's beside me, also teaches in the journalism program at Mount Royal University. Uh, she teaches uh, reporting and feature writing and served as the faculty editor of the Calgary Journal, which uh, has twice won the Pacemaker Award for the best four-year non-daily newspaper. Uh, my name is Archie McLean. Again, I'm at Mount Royal University. Uh, before coming here, I was the managing editor at CBC North, uh, where I led a team of journalists. Uh, we worked across three territories and one province in 10 languages on radio, TV, and digital. Um, <coughs> Before going up north, I worked at the Edmonton Journal and also a taught at McEwen University in Edmonton. So we will keep this all uh, very informal, so please interrupt if you have questions. Uh, we got lots of time, and, uh, and otherwise I'm going to turn it over to uh, Errol to get us started here. Thank you, Archie, and thank you for attending this morning, this rainy morning on Sunday. So, um, university and college campuses across the United States and Canada have recently launched, partnered, or collaborated with news services, investigative journalism centers, and nonprofit or commercial news outlets. So, these initiatives give students valuable training and help provide a public service, filling gaps in local news coverage. So according to Nicholas Lehman from the uh, Columbia Journalism School, he said, like teaching hospitals, journalism schools can provide essential services to their communities while they are educating their students. But there's also a longer history of journalistic collaborations between professional journalists and students from which we can learn if we're talking about things like the local news deserts. So I, I'd like to um, trace a little bit of a history of journalistic collaborations with students and student journalism both on campus and beyond our campuses. So widely distributing content by student journalists could help circulate more high quality news and uh, address the problem of local news deserts. So there's local, uh, there's, there's evidence of local news coverage produced by students that could be traced back to 1920. Has, that, has anyone heard about the um, the situation that happened in Winnipeg in 1920 when uh, the three daily newspapers ceased publication for six days due to a print shortage, a newsprint shortage. Anyone hear about that? No. Good. We're learning something new. Um, so the University of Manitoba's uh, student newspaper called the Manitoban did have enough newsprint at the time so what the students did was that they converted their weekly uh, student newspaper into a daily newspaper and it replaced the city's established local news outlets for four of those six days from January 19th to 22nd, 1920. 
Um, so in a front page article, which you see on the screen in the uh, January 19th edition of the uh, Manitoban, it, it says, the students of the University of Manitoba, believing that during the present shortage of newsprints, they can best serve the public at large by endeavoring to supply current news, will publish their weekly newspaper, the Manitoban Daily, until the regular newspapers are again issued. So as the Manitoban was unable to access newswire services, they did have to draw on radio broadcasts from the United States as a source of non-local news content, which is interesting in and of itself. And another little tidbit here, if there's any, uh, any people who know stuff about Canadian broadcasting history, the editor of the student paper at the time was Graham Spry who would go on to uh, champion the cause for public broadcasting in Canada. So established media publer publishers and editors have also long provided students with learning experience, giving them the power to temporarily run mainstream media companies. So in 1933, the Vancouver Sun gave students from the University of British Columbia an opportunity to take over the newsroom for a day. Is anyone familiar with this, this case? Good. New knowledge. What year was this? This was 1933. And it's interesting that both of these things happened. To, so to contextualize this a bit, uh, both of these um, events happened even before we had formal journalism uh, programs in Canada. Um, for those of you who are familiar or not familiar with um, journalism education history in Canada, we didn't get our, our first formal journalism programs in Canada until the mid-1940s. So, pretty interesting accomplishment. So, the, the UBC, the university student newspaper, announced um, that the students would so they announced the UBC invasion of the Sun on January 13th, 1933, writing that members of the Students' Publications Board would put out their first edition of the Vancouver Daily Newspaper on January 17th, 1933. So a front page headline in the Sun on January 17th read, Varsity Students Edit Sun Today. You see that um, on the screen, it's a little bit, uh, unclear, um, but that, that's the best copy that I could find at this point. So the lead read, the Vancouver Sun today is in the hands of the University of British Columbia students. They didn't. It was the students who were running the UBC uh, student newspaper. Yeah. Good question. And there, there actually is a list. It's hard. It's illegible, even in bar barely legible, even in the the uh, the article that I have, the print version. But they do list the names of all of those students in there too. Oh, thank you. So, additionally, another interesting example, historical example, students have collaborated with. Uh, professional journalists with a professional journalist labor union and this little case study here actually stems from a larger project that I had been working on and um, an article is forthcoming in the journal journalism practice in July so Ontario University students collaborated with striking editorial employees at the Thompson newspaper owned Peterborough Examiner during a strike in 1968 to 1969 after the Toronto Newspaper Guild called on the students to support the news workers on the picket line. So Guild members and students from the University of Guelph's Ontario newspaper launched a tabloid called the Peterborough Free Press and I have a page up on the screen to give you an idea of what one of the newspapers looked like. So they published the 6,000 copy circulation free press for nearly two months, financing it through advertising and sales. It was a weekly newspaper. They published about eight issues of it. 
and the free press described itself as an alternative to the examiner. And another little tidbit, because we have some, some time I hear, um, there was a study conducted for the Kent Commission, the Royal Commission on Newspapers in 1981. Arthur Siegel did, um, did a content analysis of the Thompson-owned Peter Examiner to see um, if there was a gap in local news coverage. And according to the study, there was a gap in local news coverage during that strike and after Thompson had um, purchased that newspaper six months before the strike began, which suggests that the Peterborough Free Press uh, was needed as a source of local news. So now um, I'd like to talk about more recent developments that uh, working journalists have engaged in with students. So there's been some nonprofit examples um, where uh, journalists or journalism instructors have collaborated or proposed to collaborate with students on university campuses. And you might be familiar with some of these examples and I think it will fit very well with what Janice and Archie are going to uh, present afterwards. So in 2009, a nonprofit and nonpartisan news startup called iNewsource was launched in San Diego. Anyone familiar with with iNews Source in San Diego. Okay, so this is currently running. Um, originally called the Watchdog Institute, the news organization is based inside the newsroom of KBBS at San Diego State University, San Diego's NPR and PBS public broadcasting affiliate. Lori Hearn, former senior editor at the newspaper, the Union Tribune, got startup financing from the newspaper's then current owner, Platinum Equity, in order to hire investigative journalists. In exchange, the news organization would provide the newspaper with news stories at a lower cost than, than the newspaper had typically spent on its reporting. So in October 2016, iNews Source announced that it would also collaborate with KFMB TV CBS 8. According to iNews Source, reporters and editors at iNews Source frequently teach, train, and mentor at San Diego State's School of Journalism and Media Studies, underscoring our commitment to the next generation of journalists. So, another example. Some journalism schools also operate their own local news outlets, and this, this might, um, there might be some more overlap with, with what you folks are going to say. So the University of Missouri, which was the first journalism school in the United States, has published its own daily newspaper called the Columbia Missourian since 1908. While the Missourian employs professional editors, it has a reporting staff of students. And temporarily, they had launched My Missourian, a joint uh, print web project that enables citizens to write their own stories. They have relaunched something along those lines, something similar, but called something else. So students um, basically edit and upload to the web the stories that, um, that citizens send in, citizen journalism. So al although the Missourian loses money, the university subsidizes it and sees it as a valuable journalism laboratory and community news service, in their own words. Other universities or colleges have launched news outlets that cover state or federal politics. So when we talk about local news deserts and what that could mean for our communities, um, scholars and journalism educators alike often point to the fact that there won't be anyone to cover our state, federal, and in Canada, provincial um, parliaments and state houses. So the University of Maryland's uh, Philip Merrill College of Journalism has run the student-powered capital news service for 26 years with news bureaus in Washington, D.C., Annapolis, and College Park, Maryland. Working under professional academic supervisors, students produce news stories for which clients pay. <coughs> 
similar outlet at Northwestern University in Illinois. Graduate students can, can take part in the Washington program and staff a news bureau there in the nation's capital where they focus on original enterprise reporting. Students' news stories have been published in newspapers across the United States, on websites, or aired on broadcasting outlets, including USA Today, Christian Science Monitor, and TV stations in various states. Another interesting example in Indiana, Franklin College, small college in Indiana, started a one-month journalism course in January 2006, sending a contingent of students to cover the Indiana General Assembly. It eventually became a statewide news gathering operation. So in 2006, four newspapers uh, published stories that the students wrote, and it grew from there. So two, two years later, that number had grown to 30 newspapers that were publishing stories by the Franklin students. In 2010, more than 50 newspapers across Indiana were publishing dozens and dozens, and dozens of students' work. So by, by 2012, Franklin had expanded the News Bureau beyond the one-month semester course. So up until this point, this was just a one-semester course, and there getting their students' work published in news outlets across the state. So what they did in 2012 was they launched a pay-for-content model that made its stories available to all 165 Hoosier State Press Association members in Indiana. So what happens is the Indiana newspapers pay between $2,000 and $6,000 annually for the right to publish any of the contents or they can pay $25 per article. Franklin also sells subscriptions to its websites, and uh, this is the, the logo that I have up on the screen, the website, thestatehousefile.com. So the subscriptions are $50 per year or $5 per month. The, the News Bureau operates on a budget of less than $100,000, excluding salaries, and Franklin's journalism department director oversees the News Bureau with the former State House correspondent who directs the 20 students. The Franklin News Service, interesting, interestingly, allocates any profits to student stipends and scholarships. Other universities have investigative journalism centers. So Andy Hall, former Wisconsin State Journal reporter, opened the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism as an independent foundation-supported nonprofit at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Its reporters include professional journalists, interns, and students. Their work has been published in newspapers across Wisconsin, on public broadcasting stations, and their affiliated websites. Similarly, faculty at Boston University, who were former TV and newspaper journalists, started the New England Center for Investigative Reporting in the College of Communication. The center is staffed by journalism faculty members and students, and they collaborate regularly with the Boston Globe, the New England Cable News, and public radio station WBUR. So in a 2011 report, C.W. Anderson, Tom Glazier, Jason Smith, and Marika Rothfeld recommended that another way to circulate more student journalism is for students to produce content at school that is then distributed through industry news outlets. We've already heard uh, some examples of that. Um, most of them have been nonprofits, though. There have been some collaborations uh, that these outlets have worked out with for-profit commercial news outlets. So some daily newspapers have paid for students' reporting to supplement their own reporting. In Florida, uh, the Miami Herald, Palm Beach Post, and the South Florida Sentinel have agreed to print work from journalism students at Florida International University. So, the so, so um, 
according to the best of my knowledge, there isn't any formal program. This is just kind of a deal that they work out with the newspapers. In New York, investigative stories from Columbia's uh, Stabile Center for Investigative Journalism also published students' work in the New York Times, the Albany, Albany Times Union, and Salon.com. In Phoenix, the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism in Arizona State University runs the Cronkite News Service, and that's the Daily News Division of Arizona PBS. So another collaboration with public broadcasting. So Cronkite News Service provides student journalism about Arizona to about 30 newspapers, television stations, and, and websites across Arizona. I've been talking a lot about the United States. I am Canadian, but I do live in the United States now. But back to Canada, and actually locally here at Ryerson, at least in part, um, we have JSource, which I think most of you are probably familiar with here. Anyone not familiar with JSource in the room? Don't be shy, okay? Um, well, I'll still tell you a little bit about what we've been doing in case you haven't followed the work and labor section. So as Archie mentioned, I am the work and labor editor there, here um, at JSource. And we do reprint um, industry standard student journalism. So if there are any students in the room and you do write about anything related to work and labor, definitely get in touch. Um, so we have reprinted content um, from professional journalists, of course, and academics. I won't get into the history, um, but in case you don't know, um, it's led by Ryerson, Laval, and Carlton. So Laval on the Francophone side. So in 2016, an interesting thing that we reprinted, in case you haven't seen it, uh, we, we, we reprinted um, stories on diversity in the media workforce and um, from the Belabored Project. Is anyone involved in that project or know about it? No? Okay, that's, that's good to know. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So CUP, the Canadian University Press, um, which is a nonprofit cooperative of student newspapers across the country, um, launched this project. It was focused on the future of work and how to determine the value of work. So CUP not only paid the students uh, $1,350 per article, but also paired them with a professional mentor, giving them both what I would say decent pay and a valuable learning opportunity. So we were really happy at JSource to be able to reprint that content. So now to wrap up. Um, so I've been considering how several universities have launched or partnered with news services, investigative journalism centers, and nonprofit or commercial news outlets. In their 2009 reports titled Restructuring American Journalism, Leonard Downey Jr. and Michael Schutzen wrote, it's now time for colleges and universities to take the next step and create full-fledged news organizations. Yet as we saw, students have played an important role, yet on a temporary basis, filling gaps in local news coverage and working collaboratively with professional journalists, 40 years before Downey and Schutzen wrote the report, um, I did provide you with some examples of professional journalists and universities um, collaborating to some extent. So there's the Peterborough example um, of uh, the union members and students starting their own newspaper. There are students taking over a newspaper in Vancouver, and there are students replacing the newspapers in Winnipeg. So in order to demonstrate that we are committed to safeguarding a future for local news, journalistic outlets um, could support content from students and student industry collaborations. But I want to end with this point. 
any viable initiative to support a future for local news must move beyond the present mindedness of today's narrative on the state of news media and also look to models, historical models. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Earl. So I'll turn it over next to uh, Janice Paskey. Janice is gonna tell us a little more about uh, what Canadian journalism schools uh, are doing uh, with their news websites. Thanks, Errol. Um, so now from the professor front in Canadian. Oh, is it not? Okay. Great. Thanks. So, thank you, Errol. Um, I have a lot more Canadian content. We were thinking at Mount Royal about all the work we do with our students day in, day out, publishing the Canadian, um, the Calgary Journal. It is a huge endeavor with 200 students all contributing to our news publication, news and features. We wanted to know a little bit more about what everybody else was doing. Um, so my presentation looks at design thinking, it's a business way of thinking, and marrying that with what's going on in Canadian collegiate news. Um, so here's my senior reporting class. Um, you know, I can't look at it without feeling so much emotion. I, I just, you know, really loved this class. They were all so diverse. Every time I think of them, I, I think of their stories and all the drafts that we did over the term. Um, I do a senior reporting class for each term. Uh, these are fourth year students delving into investigative issues, into profile, profiles, coming up with stories that no one else is covering from a 20 year old point of view. Um, and I think one thing we haven't talked about is just what fun this is. And um, I'm just always astounded by the originality of their stories. And they're out in communities that I'm certainly not out in every day. Uh, so there's my fourth years and I, I just salute them. Um, very different viewpoints, um, coming from very different backgrounds. And I think this represents a lot of what classes look like across Canada. Um, so what, you know, we asked that question, everybody's asking, can Canadian uh, journalism schools do more to fill local gaps in news? And for the purpose of this study, I'm talking about publications that exist within our programs that are supervised by a faculty editor or instructor. Um, so we didn't really know anything about what was happening with a lot of publications. I certainly knew Ryersonian existed. I've heard of some of the other publications, but so much in our world every day um, that we were wanted to look outside and find out a little bit more about the mystery of Canadian collegiate news. Um, so we put out a call to all colleges and universities um, asking for their faculty editors to contribute. In the end, we had 10. Um, we're very grateful, 10 colleges, 10 universities. Um, and we found two things. Um, some publications cover exclusively campus news and some cover campus news and external news. Um, some do a mix. We asked about city hall coverage, healthcare coverage, um, school boards, the type of, and crime. So the type of news that we would um, typically consider to be local news. Um, our participating publications, you can kind of see them here. Um, first of all, we asked about stories with impact. Uh, we're really curious to see what the faculty editors thought um, were the stories that had the most impact in their communities. So I'll take you f through a few of them because I think they're really interesting. Um, in Halifax, a story about poor families reaching out on Kijiji, saying, we need help. So of course, you know, really a story of the times. And this really resonated with the communities, just to find out this is what's happened and this is how families now need to try to get help on Kijiji. And I actually just sold something myself to, you know, gave away furniture to somebody said, I'm collecting furniture for a you know, poor family, can we have your furniture? Yes, absolutely. So a whole world there in Kijiji. Um, here, the Ryersonian uh, did a series of articles about Sam the Record Man. Uh, Ryerson had committed to save the sign, the Sam the Record Man sign, and apparently wasn't going to do it. So a series of articles here by students at Ryerson 
uh, uncovered what was going on, and in the end, the sign was saved. And this really resonated with both the Ryerson community and the community off campus. Um, at Calgary Journal, where I work, um, Sally Haney, our faculty editor, chose this story on the 60s scoop um, as a story that really resonated. Um, they received a lot of feedback. Um, it was a powerful story done by a, a journalist called Cameron Perrier, who's now with CBC. And when we talk about impact, it was interesting. I mean, this story had about 4,000 page views, um, where a story one of my students did on a missing youth in Calgary, um, a guy that went to a party, took a ride home, was never seen again, had 14,000 page views in two hours and nearly crashed our system. And I said to Sally, why would you pick this and not that? And I think it speaks to the type of input we have when we think about impact. She just felt that you know, serving an underserved community, hearing from the Aniskim Center, our Native Student Center, Indigenous Student Center, and from that community really resonated with her in terms of impact, where some of us might look at just sheer metrics. So there are different ways of looking at impact. Um, Algonquin Times covered its Muslim Students Association. They had um, students who were arrested and were implicated in crime, so they covered what was going on in terms of the Muslim Students Association and recruitment for Syria. Um, that was chosen by their faculty editors as, as a story with impact. Um, the student union, student unions are always so great to cover because they really work in secret and they do crazy things. And I've seen this 30 years working in, in universities all over Canada. Um, so the spoke at Conest Conestoga College, uh, their faculty editor served up um, a group of stories about the students union that really resonated and an impact in that community. Um, Inc. Online out of the University of Regina, they covered the provincial budget, 52,000 page views. And you can see a real gap there that the University of Regina Journalism School filled. QNet News out of is this Loyalist, Loyalist? Um, they covered a school teacher um, who was convicted of abusing her students, this time a female school teacher, we often hear of males, um, that resonated. Um, this was Centertown News. They did a whole series of stories about police racism, police brutality. They had a lot of community input from that. Their editor chose that. So you certainly see the types of stories, really important stories that are they're having impact and resonating in communities, um, often undercover stories that other organizations aren't doing. Um, importantly, many speakers have talked about collaborations. So here were some of the ones that were mentioned. JSource, you know, students writing for JSource, interning. Um, one organization did reciprocal Facebook likes with their daily, so agreeing to support each other, producing a book with a not-for-profit partner, covering murdered and missing indigenous women with another site um, in the Maritimes. Faculty contribute, that was mentioned as um, collaboration. Um, collaborating with local news agencies. Um, interestingly, we noted there was no kind of inter-university collaborations. Um, that anyone had mentioned, and maybe they do exist, and we need to ask more specifically. Yep? So at the OJEA, which is the college's sort of educator, we just had a meeting a couple weeks ago, and for the first time, we decided to do a collaboration. Yay! Um, so it's just, it's just Starting? Kind of, OK. Okay. Oh, fantastic. That's great to hear, and it's great to hear this movement, because, you know, collaborating, we are much stronger. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, we asked about how programs support local news. Um, at the Calgary um, Journal, where I work, our, our um, managing editor has course release to spend more time with the journal and with those masthead groups. We're able, we were also able to get um, subsidized summer students, so the government subsidizes wages. They don't allow any more unpaid internships or honorariums like we used to do, so they subsidize half the hourly rate of student workers, so it's called STEP program. We have three STEP students this year working on the Calgary Journal and taking that over the summer. Um, other organizations meant, um, talked about providing students to the CBC, um, providing interns, often unpaid was how they said they supported local news, 
Um, once again, faculty contributed, and one organization um, gave modest payments to a local cartoonist. And I'll have to look up and see exactly who that was. So that was original. Um, so let's talk about opportunities. Um, we have established publications with histories um, that are up and running every semester. Experienced faculty with a lot of experience guiding students, a lot of student reporters. Um, and also, these organizations and these publications function all within charitable organizations. So there is potential there, I think probably unrealized. Um, another faculty editor mentioned we're not advertiser dependent, and if we've all worked in those organizations and there is a lot of pressure, so that's actually a liberation that we have. There's so many undercovered stories. Um, we can provide new voices. There's collaboration possibilities. Um, variables that might affect outcome, audience needs, um, the desire to actually focus on local news, and the enthusiasm of the faculty supervisor. I think you have to be excited and into it. Our challenges, the number one was time and energy of the faculty supervisor. If any of you have done this, it is not for the faint of heart. It takes a ton of energy to get students up and running, uh, just doing the basics, uh, honoring an ethics code, honing your story ideas. It is a ton of work. Um, so that came as our lead challenge. Um, they talked about, you know, some students aren't interested in local news. Fair enough. Um, there's student turnover, so you always have a new group to train. There's lack of publishing continuity because, you know, we usually do an eight-month schedule and then the summer everybody goes. Um, and often they said the students weren't taken seriously by sources, so sources aren't returning their calls, to which I say that's not just students. Uh, nobody returns their calls. You have to keep at it. Um, some saw the publications as a showcase for student work, not necessarily uh, periodic or episodic um, local news coverage, and that we really had an educational mandate first over the publishing mandate, which I think everybody would agree with. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, marrying that with design thinking. Um, Richard Martin at the Rotman School wrote a book on design thinking, which is a business way of thinking that allows for innovation. On one side, he talked about data-driven information numbers, data, reliability, and on the other side, intuition, observation, imagination, configuration that allows for innovation. And he argued if businesses don't do this second side, they die. Everybody rewards reliability, but somehow we need to work in the second side of thinking, which allows for innovation. So if we look at the analytics, um, for Canadian Collegiate News, we saw incredible audiences, monthly unique visitors between 6,800 6, 6, up to 18,000 a month for an average of 9,419, which is really significant, especially if you look at what's going on in some communities. That would far outweigh many community organization, news organizations. Um, also, a real a commitment to print publications. Nine out of the 10 had print publications with combined copies of up to 200,000 a year. Seven of the 10 faculty editors said they're actively talking about how they can fill local news gaps. Um, that being said, there was not a high, high commitment to local news. Most said it was moderate, okay? 100% um, of the publications exist in registered charities. I already mentioned that. Um, all of the students receive credit for their work. So there's built-in positive analytics. Imagination, there is a desire to collaborate. Many faculty editors said we'd like to collaborate more with new local news organizations. We're still trying to work that out or we don't get taken up on, on the offer. Our time is tight, um, we know that. How do we get the maximum impact for the effort? How do we plan coverage, investigations, perhaps collaborate just in the way that you were talking about? Um, how do we measure story impact? Is it, is it feedback that you get? Is it, is it metrics? How do we create a network of journalism publications? We can celebrate what we do. If anything, I, I think it's under, we are underreported as we do underreported stories. Share, how do we advocate? How do we tap into these philanthropic supports that we heard about yesterday that happened in the United States? An observation, what, what do we see um, in how people consume news, the stories they're interested in? I mean, First on the ground, for me, I learned so much from my students. You know, they'll be out smoking with somebody and say, I heard X. And one of the stories actually the CBC just did about a wealthy philanthropist who became vitamin D obsessed, I kid you not. 
and, and funded so many organizations so he could get poor people to take his pill packages. And my student brought that to me because he was smoking with some guys outside a free dental clinic. And these homeless guys didn't want to take these pill packages to get free dental care. So he was first kind of bringing that story to, to us. I mean, we didn't have the resources the CBC did to investigate and bring that to light. But those students are often the first to observe what's going on in communities. Um, so thinking about the imagination, um, I'd just like to thank all the research participants, and here they are that, that helped us. They were not anonymous. Um, we asked them just to speak on the record. Um, so our conclusion is just, you know, what is our Collegiate News sweet spot? What can we do? Um, how can we collaborate more together? We know so much is happening. Um, so I wanted to begin the conversation today. Here's a picture of beautiful Mount Royal University in the summer. And we're never there in the summer. It never looks like this. But uh, when I asked the PR people for a you know, picture of our beautiful Mount Royal University, Calgary, Alberta, this is what they sent me. This study was done with my colleague, Archie McLean, um, with Sally Haney, who couldn't, who couldn't be here this weekend, our, our managing editor of the Calgary Journal. I want to thank you for listening and coming out this morning. It, it's really been a joy to do this study and to connect with other faculty editors. Thank you. Well, thanks again, Janice. So I was a part of uh, the, this research study uh, with Janice, and one of the things, uh, now that she's presented the overview of it, we want to go a little deeper into one specific aspect of, uh, of it, and particularly uh, what, what we see as some of the opportunities. So uh, I think Janice ran through what some of the potential opportunities are. Uh, collaboration was a big one uh, that emerged, and, and how to do things better and differently. Uh, but the one uh, I want to talk about specifically today uh, was social media, and opportunities there uh, for our news sites and for our students to do better and, and different coverage on social media. So again, these are the uh, faculty, excuse me, the journalism school publications that we spoke to. Uh, and as Janice mentioned, it, it's, it's inspiring in a lot of ways to go through these publications. You know, there is a lot of excellent content, excellent stories being published every single day on these sites and, uh, and on social media as well. And I think for most of us who are in journalism education, we've got our nose in our own publication with our own students and, and doesn't really afford us a lot of time to look more broadly at, uh, at what everybody else is doing. And I think uh, my talk won't get into it too much, but I think there is a lot of room for collaboration amongst all these publications. We all f uh, face similar challenges. We all have similar opportunities. We all have these keen young students who come in uh, every year uh, ready to do work, uh, and, and the question is how best to harness that. Uh, but my, my talk today will be, will be relatively short and focused just on the social media piece of it. Uh, so here's what we learned. Um, Everybody is on social media in one way or another. So everybody, all the respondents, we had nine respondents to, who, who we asked about social media. Uh, and, and in a subsequent study, it would be interesting to go a little deeper because the questions we asked were pretty simpler, simple. Just, are you on social media? What platforms? Can you tell us a bit about your likes, followers, etc.? So everybody is on Facebook, which is hardly a surprise. Um, all nine uh, survey respondents said they were on Facebook. Their publication used Facebook. Uh, and the number of likes ranged from about 3,800, give or take, QNET News, uh, to 200, 300 kind of range. Uh, similarly, all of the publications are on, um, uh, on Twitter as well, and the followers range from roughly 4,500 to, you know, 51. Um, the publications are also on uh, Instagram, about half of them are on Instagram, uh, and I think, and, and again, the followers range from roughly 500, give or take, to, uh, to as few as 110. Uh, I don't know what's showing up on the screen there. Uh, but it looks like possibly the bottom two got cut off. Uh, the journalism schools, is it showing anything below Instagram? No. Okay, well then, uh, journalism schools are also on other, uh, other platforms on social media as well. Uh, some are on YouTube, about half of them upload videos to YouTube. Uh, other publications have played around with other platforms. Snapchat came up, some people have used that. Um, and I think everybody's experimenting this, with this stuff. But the, the talk I'm uh, going to give today is primarily about Facebook. And the reason for, for those of you who work in news or work with student educators, for even amongst our demographic, Facebook is the 900-pound gorilla of social media. If you look at uh, engagement, if you look at the amount of traffic that's referred to the site, if you look at uh, amongst all demographics, Facebook is really the king. And, and Twitter, uh, I'm a big Twitter user myself, but, I, but it doesn't do a lot for driving uh, traffic to websites. And it, it's not even, in a lot of ways, the best uh, place for audience engagement. I think in those ways, Facebook really is the, is the king here. So, so mostly when I talk about social media today, it will be in the context of of Facebook. Um, so uh, 
we asked how publications use social media. Why are they using social media? And we asked them to, to, to identify. And the, the three that emerged as the top reasons, perhaps not surprisingly, are to engage the audience, uh, to grow the audience, and to drive traffic uh, to online journalism. And Facebook is well suited for those things. Um, but what I would suggest is that we can do better on that front. Um, but I did want to mention, oops, uh, there are lots of stories being shared and posted on social media. I don't want uh, anything I say today to take away from that. Um, I'm going to be focused more on the, the delivery or the way we do social media, but it's not so much that the content itself is not a problem. The stories themselves are not necessarily a problem in and of itself. Um, but there's lots of good examples of, of excellent use of social media. The Ryersonian had at least one Facebook video with more than 19,000. I think it's even up to maybe 21,000 views. Um, a lot of the, the Calgary Journal, QNet News, and others are doing native social video. I saw some Facebook Live examples. Uh, there are some good examples of, uh, of interesting use of social media. Uh, but I would say uh, that if local news sites, excuse me, journalism news sites are serious about filling the news gap, we need to do better on social media. We need to do it better and we need to do it differently. Um, the reasons for this uh, are pretty simple. The, the first one is to find new audience. You know, the, the number of, I, I meant to actually pull, and I, I didn't do it sadly, but the, the percentage of traffic that comes to the Calgary Journal website from Facebook, it dwarfs everything else. That is how uh, people find our news. And no matter what, uh, what our audience looks like now, the potential to grow it on social media is high. Um, and our, our audience is changing how they get news. They get it primarily on social devices through social media. Uh, the second one is to just simply better serve our audience um, by, by being where they are, by taking the news to them, uh, and by taking advantage of the community building properties of social media. And then finally, uh, if we're just talking about the skill set that we're delivering to our students, uh, th these social media skills uh, are in demand, both by editors um, and by employers in the larger media world. So if we're not giving students these skills, if we're not talking about these things, then we're not giving them what, what to me is an essential skill set for uh, communications and journalism students. Uh, so let's just uh, take each of these uh, separately here, and we'll talk just a little bit uh, briefly about audience here. Um, the numbers I have here, these are from the Pew Research Study. I wasn't able to find similar Canadian numbers, but if people have them, I'd, be, uh, I'd love to know about it. Um, this is uh, the Pew tracked 40 news publishers uh, over time and looked at their uh, monthly uh, visitors and the amount of time that uh, people spent on the sites. And on the left-hand side, is, uh, on the, the two right-hand bars are mobile and desktop traffic, and then um, and, and the numbers there are the number of publications. All you need to take from this slide is the general theme, which is <laughs> the gains in traffic have come almost exclusively from mobile. Uh, desktop traffic has remained relatively stable, and in lots of cases has actually declined, but mobile traffic is going up. Uh, and that probably makes sense for most of you if you think about how you consume media yourselves. You know, not a lot of people are firing up the desktop uh, on a Sunday morning to, you know, check what's going on in the city or check the sports scores or whatever. You're pulling out your phone and, and doing that. So I think when people think about their own media diet, they recognize that mobile is where uh, the hits are coming. Um, and of the people that use social media, this is another uh, Pew research slide, people are using social media to get news more and more often. So the first uh, graphic there is, is Twitter. So in 2013, uh, roughly half the people who use Twitter used it to get news. Uh, two years later, uh, it had jumped to 63%. And Facebook, the difference is even more stark. In 2013, about 47% uh, of people used Facebook to get news. Uh, now it's up to roughly 63%. Uh, so for better or worse, many people are getting their news real or otherwise on uh, on Facebook uh and then if you look at the demographic shifts, the, the, the shift towards mobile, the shift towards social is happening amongst all demographics. It cuts across demographics uh, in an interesting way, but specifically the 18 to 34 year old demographic uh, is spending more time on mobile than on desktop. Again, anyone who hangs around students will tell you that that, that is intuitive, that makes sense. But if you look at the 18 to 34 demographic, they're spending 72% of their time on mobile devices compared to 28% on desktop. So again, it's a mobile audience and though it cuts across all demographics, it's young people more who are using mobile than, uh, than older people. 
Uh, and then finally, uh, if you doubt any of this, the, des the difference between desktop and mobile, uh, these are the ad dollars spent in the United States between uh, 2010 and 2015. And if you look in 2010, there was very little of the, of the overall ad buy going into mobile. Uh, in 2015, it's roughly half and half, and I think the trend line is pretty clear. You're going to see more and more ad dollars going into mobile. So again, if you, d if you <laughs> follow the money is a good way to see where the audience is going, and you can see that the money is following quite clearly the audience in this case. Uh, so the reason I put up those slides is, is mostly to talk about uh, to make the point that our audience is mobile and they're social and particularly our young audience. Now, the audience for all of our publications, the journalism school publications, is different. Centertown News, for example, covers a geographic area, uh, but a lot of our publications do cater to and are run by young people who are getting their no news from, um, from social uh, and mobile. Um, but looking at the way that the, the stories are presented on Facebook in particular, um, I saw a lot of evidence of what David Scott, some of you know, may know David Scott, he's a media executive uh, here in Toronto. He worked previously for the Boston Globe. And he calls it a platform-centric approach to digital journalism. And I think of this as uh, like the Google era the, era, the first era of digital journalism approach to telling stories. Um, and what I mean by that is, uh, this is again from David Scott, it's a graphical representation of it. So the article is king in this model. So you write a thousand word article, any hundred word article, and then you use Facebook to drive traffic to it. You, you use Twitter to drive traffic to it. You use uh, everything funnels back into the article posted on a website. Um, and uh, this, uh, and, and that, that's, that's sort of the first, uh, it didn't require newsrooms uh, to change what they do very much. If you're already putting out a website, it's pretty simple just to put that same article on all your various platforms and try to drive traffic back to it. And that's what most of the content on Journalism School Facebook sites are. It's a posting of an article that's been done and lives on the website and it's, hey, come check out this thing we did. Uh, but we need to optimize our stories better for social media. Um, David Scott calls this the story-centric approach to news, and I think of it as th the next era of digital journalism, the social era, the Facebook era of digital journalism. And to look at it graphically, it looks more like this. So the story sits at the heart of what you do. So, uh, and then you take pieces of the story uh, or, or, and, and optimize them for the various platforms. So that's not to say you wouldn't do a text-based article, uh, but you might do that for the website, and you might do a, face a 30 second native Facebook video for Facebook, and you might uh, do something different for Twitter, and you might push uh, or optimize another part of it for a newsletter. It's using the various pieces of the story uh, to optimize uh, for social media. And the truth is, that I, I didn't see a lot of evidence uh, of journalism school publications uh, taking this approach to social media. Um, there were some examples. Uh, QNet News and the Calgary Journal uh, have done some native Facebook videos. Uh, the Ryersonian, again, had a pair of videos um, that had more than 21,000 views. Uh, and this one here, which I might as well show you, I won't show the whole thing. I thought I got a kick out of it. This is a Ryersonian video, which uh, I hope will play. But it had, uh, I believe, yeah, uh, 5,300 views, 78 likes, uh, 10 comments, 20 shares. Again. Oh. I would say it's not my email if it's not going to show up. Is it on screen? Uh, on screen? Yet. You know what? Let's just skip it. Yeah. It's a good video, but would you want to see it? Yeah. All right, let's see. Yeah, that's yeah, true. <laughs> Before we get started, I will explain what it is. This is a uh, Ryerson student uh, delivering the news over a beer. <laughs> and uh, you got it. You know Laura? Yeah. OK. Uh, I got a kick out of it, and what I liked about it is that it's, in some ways, it's a traditional way of presenting the news with a little twist. And if you can, if you see, again, the, the number of views that it got and the response from the audience, uh, people liked it, you know? Um, Yeah. Really 
Yeah, let's do that. We'll, uh, we'll watch this on the back end of things. Um, but again, it reflects uh, uh, just a, a slightly different way of telling stories on social media. And it, for those of you who've ever tracked metrics on social media, video really is king in a lot of ways on Facebook. And uh, the way we do video for Facebook is different than you might do it in a broadcast context. You know, you don't start with a stand up, you start right in the middle of the action. You want to keep it short and tight. And again, Facebook has its own video norms uh, in the way that any platform does. And uh, it's important uh, for our students to learn how to do that as opposed to in other, other platforms. Um, and again, there was some uh, evidence of that. Another one, uh, the Calgary Journal did quite an interesting uh, Facebook uh, post, excuse me, video about a avalanche dog at Sunshine uh, Ski Hill near uh, Banff. And uh, again, we, you know, it, it had 1,400 views, which isn't a ton, but it's uh, quite a few. Um, but you can see there's a whole lot of likes, seven comments. Uh, these sort of things generate a lot of interest on social media. And if you look again at the metrics of some of these uh, sites, uh, the video posts get a lot more engagement, a lot more interest uh, than the text base and particularly the story-centric kind of um, uh, uh, posts that, that are the staple of these sites still. Um, I wanted to talk uh, next about engagement. Um, Facebook shares, likes, and comments have become a primary measure of engagement for newsrooms. Um, and by those measures, I think journalism school websites can do better. Facebook is uh, and can be um, a really fantastic way of building and representing a community. And some of my thinking on this comes from uh, the work, uh, some of the work I did at CBC North. Um, we, while I was there, we, we, we had a big uh, push towards digital as a lot of the CBC did. Um, and we launched Facebook sites, uh, I won't bore you with all the ins and outs, but we launched Facebook sites in each of the, the northern territories that we covered. And they all were uh, extremely successful. But the one uh, that was, I would say, most successful and uh, is the Facebook page in Nunavut, and I assume this is not coming up on the page as well. Right? Yeah, why don't, why don't you give it a try? Uh, the CBC Nunavut page, so Nunavut uh, has about 30,000 people, and when we moved into digital at the CBC, a lot of people were concerned about access to the internet in Nunavut. Uh, broadband is a huge challenge. Um, it all comes through satellite. Uh, mobile is expensive. The internet is expensive generally. Uh, but what we found, uh, and it happened quickly, <laughs> was that Facebook uh, is, it's hard to overstate how important Facebook is for people there. Uh, Facebook works for the population up there for a number of reasons. Uh, first, uh, is it coming up there? Uh, first, people live over these vast geographic expanses and they have a large extended families and have a need to keep in touch with people. Also, Nunavut uh, is a distinct cultural group. Uh, roughly 80% or more of the population is Inuit, uh, and they don't necessarily see their information and their news reflected anywhere else in Canada. And they don't even identify so much with First Nations uh, groups in the South. The Inuit people are very, uh, have their own distinct culture. And so there is, there was, and there is a community that existed and had nowhere, I shouldn't say nowhere, oh, it's up there, great, uh, to, to congregate and to talk and to share their stories and to share their culture. And I would, the second we put this Facebook page up, uh, that catered specifically to Nunavut, to a new Nunavut audience and Nunavut news, uh, people responded like crazy to it. So I didn't, um, I had a quick look at the posts that were up there uh, last night. Let's just have a, a quick look at it. And what's beautiful about this page is if you go to the CBC Nunavut page, it's one of those things where you could be nowhere else. You, you immediately get a sense of place and a sense of the people just by looking at the Facebook page. Uh, a community formed organically on the page and it, and it talks to itself on this Facebook page. So, so this is a news story. This is a classic kind of, uh, uh, the sort of thing we saw a lot of in the journalism school sites. We're pushing a story out there. But the page is a lot more diverse than that. Um, oops. Oh, come on. I'm just trying to scroll down the page. Is it not scrolling? Okay. Good. Uh, okay, so there's another... So people started to share their pictures. This one is uh, a, a sunny Saturday in Clyde River, sent in by Jackery C. Matu. I'm not even going to try. Uh, this, uh, people started sending in photos just to share with people. They just want to share beautiful photos from where they are. So that's one. Uh, here's another one, Clouds and Rankin Inlets from Roxanne Mesharlak. Uh, here's another one. A guy named John Franklin often sends, sends photos in from his bush camp, his fishing camp out on the land. And he caught this bizarre looking fish uh, and just sent it into the CBC Facebook page to say, to share it with people and to talk about it. So look at this. He got, 
271 shares. Uh, how many comments in total? Many comments, Two, uh, 105 comments in total. And most of them are people just saying like, wow, crazy fish, man. Uh, it, <laughs> and, and some other people saying, I think I know what this is. And, and, the, and the crowd actually looked, um, for some reason the comments aren't loading here, but uh, the crowd actually came up with an answer for the guy. Here's the kind of fish it is. We catch these off the Grand Banks in Newfoundland all the time. Uh, people just want to share and talk about these things. Uh, here's another one. This guy sent in a picture. This is uh, Kunanan Rubin Jr. And he's sending him a, a picture of himself feeding a fox. And he says, I thought I'd feed an animal since animals from the land feed us. Okay, interesting, and, and an interesting perspective on things. But in the comments, people were saying, how irresponsible of you to feed a wild animal? Uh, th and how many comments are there on this page? There are 91 shares. Uh, and more than 20 comments. And the comments are kind of split, but a lot of people are saying, hey, that's irresponsible of CBC to share that, irresponsible of you to feed this thing, but it's a vigorous uh, debate. And the kind of debate that's going, only going to happen in Nunavut, you, you, a southern audience would not respond in the same way to this picture. The, the, the community building properties of Facebook are uh, incredible in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's not easy to do. Uh, and the first step is to know your audience. Um, so again, I, what I think is that, uh, our student journalism sites can do a better job of this community building thing. I'm not saying that all of our sites could just plunk down a Facebook page and suddenly a community forms around it. I think it takes a lot of work. Uh, but I do think it's, it's an area and it's a skill that, that, uh, that our students can, can develop. Um, so just as some examples. Uh, is that showing up on the screen? Okay, good. Um, so, you know, again, you know, faculty time came up as a big constraint for student journalism sites. I'm not trying to tell people they need to turn over the apple cart, but engagement can be pretty simple. Uh, sharing with the audience and inviting them to share, making it a reciprocal relationship between the audience and the community that you're serving. This is not a one-way push of information is the point I'm trying to make. We're, we shouldn't just be taking our stories that we're doing and shoving them out into the world and saying, behold, we, this is a great thing we've created. It needs to be reciprocal. Re uh, um, relationship. Another skill that students can practice, can be involved in, is to be an active participant in conversations, to help moderate and guide and, and direct a conversation into positive directions. Uh, the community on Facebook is generally quite uh, self-policing, but we all have dealt with trolls or people who want to derail a conversation, and there's a role uh, and an increasing skill in journalism to be able to direct these conversations on social media, to be able to deal with the unruly nature of it and try to, to, to direct it and move it a certain way. Um, and then just to serve as a community hub for news and information. Um, uh, is, is doesn't necessarily take a lot of time and energy, but it's an important uh, thing. And then finally, the relevant skills. I think, uh, I won't dwell on this too much, I think in some ways it's a pretty obvious point, but most news organizations now have social media editors. I think if you look in the past, I don't have the data, but if you look in the past five years, say, about um, uh, who, uh, about which news organizations have social media editors, they almost all do now. And some news organizations even have platform specific editors, a Facebook editor, a Snapchat editor, or whatever. Um, and marketers, communications professionals, are, are graduates do all kinds of jobs and they all need these kind of skills. Uh, so I just wanted to leave uh, everyone, our, our huge audience here today, with some, with some ways to get started the way I see it. So the first one is to know your audience. You can't serve them through social media if you don't know who they are. So the Facebook page for Centertown News, for example, is going to look very different from the Facebook page of a publication that serves campus. The first step really is to know who your audience is so that you can, you can build that community. And, uh, and I think most uh, editors, most people who work have an idea of their audience, although we were talking about this, we're not as sure as we'd like to be out of who the Calgary Journal's audience. Who is this publication for? It's a great question. But you can't really design a social media strategy, a Facebook strategy, unless you know who you're serving to. And that's going to be easier for some publications uh, rather than others. Um, the, the second one is there is this default in journalism school programs to make a text story, in particular the, the, the sort of mushy middle length story like a 700 word text story as the default. We always tell a story in a 700 word text story and then you can, and then from there it can go on social media. Well, I would argue that that shouldn't, uh, if we're talking about senior students especially, um, that should not be the default necessarily. I'm not saying that that should never be the way to tell a story, but each story should start with the premise of let's, let's take this story and what is the best way to tell it? How could we tell this thing on Facebook? How should we do a print style article? Uh, lots of times the answer will be yes, but it shouldn't be the default for everything we do. Um, 
it's worthwhile to experiment with native social content, especially on Facebook. There's not really a down, much of a downside to doing this, and oftentimes it doesn't take that much uh, work. So, uh, so things like Facebook Live, for example, it's easy to do Facebook Live, and, uh, and there's no reason why students shouldn't be doing that sort of thing. Same with cutting videos uh, for, uh, for Facebook, especially doing Facebook photo galleries, stuff that plays well and lives well in, in social media. Uh, first one is to discuss engagement with the audience and how to build and measure it. Again, I don't expect that journalism school publications are immediately going to have this great community like the CBC Nunavut Facebook page, uh, but it's worthwhile to talk to students about those community building properties of Facebook. How, how do we build engagement? What does it look like when we have uh, a positive engagement on a page? Um, how can we promote it? How can we, and can we look at the metrics to see why one story seemed to engage or capture the audience and another one didn't? It's, it's important to have those conversations, even if your page isn't you know, uh, as good as you'd like it to be. Uh, and then finally, to, to be choosy around social media. Uh, I've talked mostly about Facebook today. I think there's this feeling among all of us that, oh my God, you know, I have to be everywhere. I don't know what the hell Snapchat is. I, I you know, it, you don't need to know them all, and no news organization does. So I would just say pick one or two platforms and do them well. You don't have to be on Pinterest and Snapchat and Peach and whatever, you know, whatever the flavor of the month is. Pick one, do it well. Uh, again, if you know your audience, you'll know where they are. It's probably going to be Facebook, but you know, a lot of young people use Instagram. That's another obvious one for, uh, for, for young people. So uh, maybe do just Facebook and Instagram, pitch the rest over the side and don't bother. Um, but, and try and do those well. You don't have to be, do, do everything. Um, so I'll leave the discussion there, I just, uh, and we'll open it up to uh, questions. I have a tradition, I, I've got to have one GIF in every presentation, so that's my last one. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have, uh, we're here for another 10 minutes or so. If people have questions, uh, we'd be uh, all happy to, uh, to answer them. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of the tool that we've used. We didn't use Snappy. We, um, I think we used Buffer, and we've used. Um, but the problem, I guess, is that uh, is that it doesn't optimize the content for the various platforms. Like, I'd rather see a Facebook-specific post uh, that works for Facebook, and then a separate tweet written for Twitter, and then. So Snappy does, that does it optimize it? Yeah. Well, then no is the answer. Yeah. It's a great question. Which one do you use? No, go ahead. I used to do some awesome uh, educational programs. Sweet. Do they? And you can optimize for uh, for the various platforms. Okay, that's great. And yeah, Hootsuite as well. We've used it before, but I think we've just used it for Twitter. Like I don't, I don't think we've taken advantage of the other. I don't think anything we do has an effect on post media or any of their decisions. And um, you know, 
and, and our managing editor, Sally Haney, mentioned this as well, and I don't think I was clear enough that she had concern about students working for free. But what if we had a foundation that came in and gave a gift and we could hire a few journalists to work with our students who also were being paid? Um, you know, I guess I see, is there, is there foundation support? Is there more? Um, so they're not just working for free. But there also has to be a benefit for students. And students are emerging with a strong portfolio at the end of their two, three, or four years, um, that's a really powerful thing for them uh, on the market. I, I would just add too that I, I don't see news as a zero sum game. You know, like we're here, it doesn't it doesn't preclude anyone from coming in the market. I just read an article about all the craft breweries in Calgary and Inglewood, and they all say, "Come on, more bring them all into the pool." You know, the more people are interested in craft beer, beer the more of a market there is for it, the more people are interested in it. I see the same thing for news. If you have a vigorous community of news, uh, you, no one thinks student publications will fill everything, and there's probably still a, a room for as many players in the field as you know as works. And plus. You know, there might be room for collaboration. You know, well, welcome, come on. We've got these students doing this work. We maybe we can help you do more. So I, I just don't see I don't see it as if we arrive and are doing this work, then nobody else, then we've taken up the whole space. I just don't think it quite works that way. Yeah, I mean, to this working. Um, no, I don't know. If it's necessary. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So just building on what uh, what Janice and, and Archie said. Um, so. Unions have also played a role in developing uh, training programs for journalists that help provide them with uh, work experience and pay, so to address the pay issue at least, and that's part of a broader project that I'm working on, so um, if you're not familiar with it, the, the CP intern program, so um, it is, uh, there is a, an honorarium that CP offers and the union matches that payment for student interns. There are other internship programs across, the can uh, across Canada and the United States, in fact, that pay students at different, so different, different rates so we can sort of overcome the, the lack of pay issue. And I would just echo um, what Archie was saying about the fact that you know, there's still room for different niche audiences and I don't. I, I. I can't see. You know, one publication in a small small community. You know, taking up all that space and precluding. You know, preventing the opportunity for others to come in there and and fill another niche of local local news and content. It's a good question. Um, it is. It's certainly a good question, um, and the funding model is is certainly a good question as well. Um, so someone was mentioning yesterday, I believe it was the person from, from Unifor about at the lunch talk about um, you know getting worker worker funded um, union funded models, and I think this is an opportunity to even potentially break up um, something like like post media. I think we, we also have to use this as an opportunity to question whether or not those for profit models, or at least the ones that <coughs> currently exist in the country, are the best models to fill the local um, news content that we need. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I ask just a general question, trying to get back to questions of politics? Uh, how well supported or not supported do you feel uh, the, the student media is by the wider university? So it seems to me one of the big issues And our graduates work in those comms offices. <laughs> Do you want to take this one, Janice? You know, we don't cover Mount Royal exclusively. Um, and whenever we do, I'm a little bit nervous, to be honest, because it's a hassle <laughs> to be covering your own institution. So I think for us, you know, and I see, I see those um, organizations that have covered their own institution, and I think I would love to hear from them. 
about that. It's a good yeah, point. It's a, there's a natural, there's a tension there to be sure. I mean, any, journalists value independence above just about anything else, and institutions value their reputation and their brand as much as anything else. And when any institution uh, is going to butt up with uh, journalists who cover it, I think that's natural. Uh, we, uh, from what I've seen, have had good support from Mount Royal, but I, but I don't think the conversation is ever over. Just. We, you have full support, full stop, do what you like. You know, I think this is, and especially if some of these publications begin to grow and flex their muscle a little more as community news services, I think, uh, I think that's a very real concern and it will continue to be. Our one one organ, um, issue we had concerned FOIP and the university wanting us to pull down all our content, arguing this was a freedom of information and privacy, that after two years, all our content should come down. Um, because that's what they do in the rest of the university, and we are within the university, not a separate publication. So that's been a really interesting issue for us from an ethical side. Could I say something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have to distinguish here between the, the, the journalistic outlets that are based in journalism or media studies programs and the publications that are run within a university but maybe run by the student associations mm -hmm. themselves and because the, the ball game is certainly different with, with both of those publications. Um, and there is historical evidence um, that would support what Janice was talking about, that, that um, universities have been concerned about student publications reporting on controversial issues, especially within the universities. And in the Canadian context, at least, this was reported in the Special Senate Committee on the Mass Media, also known as the Davy Report, in 1970. So this actually, this phenomenon, if we can call it that, gave rise to faculty publications or universities um, creating their own counter um, publications. I know when I when I was at McGill and we have the McGill, um, what is it? The daily. The daily is the student uh, publication, and there's also the Reporter. But there there was one that was that was um, launched by the administration, and you know their communications team does their own McGill publication. And I would assume that other universities that have student papers. The same thing is there, you know, the competing um, publication from the Office of, of Communication, something like that. We're, we're almost out of time, but we'll take Tyler's question here. We'll make it quick, and, we'll, uh, and then we'll wrap. Yeah, quick question, Tyler. Um, did you guys look at, as Janice and Mary did, at evaluation models and uh, attached to the, the publications? So were they attached to a course? Did they run separate from the course? Did multiple courses contribute to the evaluation? How was it created? Did you look at stuff That's like good question. I don't, we didn't have a question specifically about that. Um, Sally at Mount Royal uh, has done a lot of work on how to evaluate the students in that digital <coughs> side of things, um, but no, we didn't, we didn't ask. There seems to be a range, though. It, it seemed that this was part of coursework for everyone, um, but we didn't ask that specific question. Okay, fair yeah. 
Well, let's wrap. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a small but yes, mighty thank crowd. You. Thank you all, and I hope you got something out of it. <laughs>